Okay, uh, our first speaker is the editor of the Skeptical Libertarian. Let's all give a warm welcome. Let's make up for the lack of people with lots of noise for Daniel Beer. <laughs> And thanks once again to the fantastic technical staff here who's helping me out with my uh, issues. Um, and uh, I want to break one of the rules of public speaking by starting out <coughs> uh, with an apology. Uh, my first apology is I'm getting over a cold, <coughs> uh, so uh, apologies in advance for that. Uh, my second apology is that I'm probably going to offend some people here, and uh, that's okay, um, but I just want you to know it's not intentional. My goal is not to provoke people. Uh, it's just to share my perspective on <clears throat> this issue. Uh, so I want to talk today about politics uh, and why our politics are so screwed up. Now, don't worry, this is not going to be you know, a political type of lecture where I try to convince you that you're wrong and I'm right, uh, because we know that that doesn't work. Uh, instead, I want to talk about uh, why these debates actually seem so intractable why we never seem to actually make a whole lot of progress uh, in politics. So why does politics suck so badly? Why does our discourse seem perpetually mired uh, in the swamp of lame ideas, ignorance, cronyism, and political favorites? Why is our policy dominated by small groups of special interests? Why do elections so often fail to settle debates? You know, a lot of people think this is because of uh, the wrong people being involved in politics. You know, Hillary Clinton or Mitt Romney or George Soros, if we just had decent, kind, honorable people in politics, then everything would be fine and our democracy would work so much better. Um, maybe, uh, but I want to suggest that uh, I think it has something to do with um, the fundamentals of our political system. Uh, there's a reason why special interests run things. There's a reason why politics always, why politicians always overpromise and overspend. Um, and there's a reason why we keep having the same old arguments over and over again. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is talk about the folk politics uh, model of democracy, uh, as told to you by this guy. Um, so we start out with the will of the people. Um, people elect politicians, representatives, to serve their interests. Politicians enact policy uh, to serve the will of the people. They task public servants with the job of carrying this out. Um, and then there's feedback. Uh, the people learn things uh, about what kind of policies they like and they don't, and then they either uh, re-elect the politicians or vote in new people. Now, uh, this sounds great, right? But I think on some level we all know that this isn't actually how our political system operates. Um, and I want to suggest that it's not that there's the wrong people being involved in this model. Uh, it's actually that we have no reason to expect uh, our electoral system to operate this way. Um, we have no reason to think that this is how the world actually works. <clears throat> and I think that economics can actually help explain why that is. Um, so I want to talk today about public choice. Um, so economics is primarily the study of private choices, uh, of the economy, of individual actors, consumers, uh, employees, industries, and so on. Um, public choice is applying those methods that we use to study uh, private actors uh, to public policy questions, to political actors and behavior. Um, these include voters, politicians, uh, bureaucrats, and special interest groups. Uh, these are the four main categories of political actors. Uh, and to do this, we're going to use what economists call the rational choice model. Um, this model is based on the premise that people uh, respond to incentives, uh, that they uh, are rationally self-interested most of the time. Nobody says that everyone is, is super selfish all the time, but let's be honest, we all care more about ourselves and our family than about everyone else. Uh, so the basic premise here is that incentives matter. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the economist, the Nobel Prize winning economist James Buchanan, who helped found the Public Choice School of Economics, described public choice as politics without romance. Um, 
because nothing could be less romantic than economics and politics, I suppose. Um, I call it politics with a, a dash of cynicism. Um, public choice recognizes the importance of incentives and self-interest in the political sphere. We don't suddenly become angels when we enter Congress or the ballot box, or uh, we're the same people we are at the supermarket and the stock market and at our jobs. Incentives matter, but they're not the only things that matters. Just as gravity isn't the only consideration uh, to think about when you're talking about um, air travel. But if you forget about gravity even for a second, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so the first group that we're gonna look at is the voters. And I put a quote up here from James Madison that I like. Uh, and he wrote, in all very numerous assemblies of whatever characters composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Had every Athenian been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly still would have been a mob. Uh, and we are no Socrates. I just want to make that clear at the, the outset. Um, <clears throat> so the will of the people. Whose will and what people? Um, of course, we don't all agree on everything. Uh, that's why we have to have elections. That's why we vote on things, because we don't all agree. If we all agreed, we wouldn't need to vote. Uh, so obviously, it's not the will of everyone. So whose will is it? Is it the will of the majority? Uh, I want to actually suggest that this is a meaningless concept. Uh, the economist Kenneth Arrow, another uh, luminary in public choice economics, um, came up with uh, the famous impossibility theorem in which he proved that it is mathematically impossible as long as people have three or more preferences or options in a, in a particular uh, sphere, there is no way to vote on, to vote one against one that will come up with, um, to turn ranked preferences into a stable majority that will beat all other majorities. Now this sounds kind of counterintuitive, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, but if you can disprove his theorem, there's a Nobel Prize uh, in it for you. So get out there. Um, so I'm going to uh, enlist the help of two people to help explain Arrow's impossibility theorem. Uh, the guy on the left here uh, is a member of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Uh, the guy on the right is Marquis de Condorcet, a French philosopher and mathematician who was shanked in the prison yard during the French Revolution. Um, but he was also a great philosopher and mathematician. Uh, so we're going to use these two people to help uh, explain why the will of the people is a meaningless concept. Now, it's a very simplified model, but it's the best I can do in the time I have. Um, so we have three people, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and they have uh, first, second, and third preferences about what policy we should use to handle the Islamic State. So Peter's first preference is stay out. We're done with Iraq. We're done with war. Let's just not do anything. His second preference is some sort of limited strike. You know, if we're not going to stay out, let's just, you know, make it unlimited involvement. His last preference is to full-on invasion of Syria. <clears throat> um, Paul, his first preference is a limited strike. He thinks that we need to do something, um, but he would prefer that it be limited. Uh, his second preference is invasion, uh, and his last preference is stay out. He thinks we need to do something, but he would prefer that it be limited, but if he can't get limited, he'll go on full-on invasion. And then there's Mary. Mary's first preference is to invade, uh, and her second preference is to stay out. So either knock ISIS out, you know, go full on, or just stay out of it altogether. Her last preference is, is kind of a half-assed drone limited strike approach. So three people, three perfectly coherent set of preferences. Um, and of course, they don't agree. So how are we going to decide? Let's vote on it. <clears throat> so let's vote on uh, drone strikes versus a full on invasion. In this case, uh, who w what wins? Drones win because Peter and Paul would both prefer drones to a full-on invasion. Uh, then now we have to do drone strikes versus staying out altogether, right? Um, <clears throat> in this case, staying out altogether wins, uh, because Peter and Mary would both prefer staying out to uh, limited strikes or drone strikes. Now Mary protests because her first preference didn't even get to vote on. Uh, she, you know, she would prefer uh, voting on staying out um, versus invasion. So let's vote on that. What wins that? Uh, invasion wins, because Paul and Mary would both prefer invasion to doing nothing. But wait, we already voted on invasion. Invasion lost. It's not the will of the people. And then drone strikes lost. 
that's not the will of the people either. And uh, invasion uh, beat staying out. So staying out's not the will of the people. Uh, so what the hell is going on here? Um, this is uh, a vote cycle. This is what Arrow is talking about, which is that there's no stable majority when you have three or more preferences that can beat all other majorities. And so we get a cycle. We go uh, drones, staying out, invasion, and then we cycle back to drones again. And if this seems like a familiar sort of uh, problem, it's because you see it every uh, election cycle, is that we go through the same set of preferences over and over again. It's not because people are changing their minds, uh, it's because this is the nature of politics. So what are politicians doing in this context? Um, well, politicians in a two-party system, in a majoritarian system, need to get 50% 50, 50 uh, of the vote plus one uh, to win any given election. Now, liberals are going to vote Democrat, we know that, and conservatives are going to vote Republican, we know that too. Um, so it's the group in the middle, the centrist, moderate voters, who determine the outcome. So politicians start out on the right or the left, but then during elections you can see them move closer to the center because they're converging on the last person that they need to win the election. So that's the preference that's going to determine any given election. Not the, not the base, not the left or the right. You're never actually going to get <laughs> Uh, politicians who reflect the preferences of their base because they don't need to be president of the Democratic Party, they need to be president of America. So majority ele majoritarian elections will always most closely reflect the preferences of the median voter. Um, <clears throat> now this is something, of all the uh, sad, depressing, offensive things that I tell people, this gets me more grief than anything else. You know, I, I tell people Jesus isn't coming back and they're like, eh, yeah, okay. Homo homeopathy is a crock of shit, yeah, okay. You know. Your vote doesn't count. Oh my God, I've, you know, I've profaned our civic religion. But really, your vote doesn't count. Um, the probability that your vote is gonna decide an election is so close to zero, it's not even worth talking about. Uh, 13 million people voted in California in the last uh, presidential election. This means that each vote had 0 0.0000076 uh, of the total voting power. Uh, it means that you would need uh, exactly uh, 6,700,000 and uh, change on each side, and then your vote is the one that tips the election. That's never happened, and it will never happen. We had a close election in Virginia, less than one percentage point uh, in the last election. Um, so people think, oh, if only more people voted. Um, you know, the margin was 16,000. 727 votes, which is 16,726 more votes than you have. Um, so your vote is, is not going to make a difference, even in close elections. So the voters face a dilemma, a uh, prisoner's dilemma. So you can study uh, science, law, philosophy, economics, poli-sci, history, current events, all you want. You can read bricks like this, uh, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, uh, and become educated uh, enough to make informed decisions, or you can watch Game of Thrones. Now, everybody and, and everybody else has the same choice. They can study uh, science, law, philosophy, etc., or they can watch fantastic cable television. Um, so what happens uh, if everybody studies and you also study? Well, the informed policy wins. Now, what happens if everybody else studies and you watch Game of Thrones? The informed policy wins and you got to see dragons. That's awesome. Um, now, what happens if you study and everyone else slacks off? Well, the stupid policy wins. Um, but if you watch Game of Thrones, and so does everybody else, the stupid policy will win, but you got to see dragons. So basically, no matter what anyone else does, it's always rational for you to watch Game of Thrones. Uh, and it's never rational to become informed about politics. So this is the prediction of economics in politics, which is that it's rational to be ignorant about politics. So does the empirics back this up? Are voters actually ignorant? You know, we all take our civic responsibilities seriously, I'm sure. Um, so do, do the studies back this up? You bet they do. Uh, here's just a few examples of political ignorance from a few surveys I collected. Um, on the question of Obamacare, 42% of Americans don't even realize it's still the law. 42, four out of 10 Americans don't know that the Affordable Care Act is still the law of the land. Um, about half of them think it was repealed or struck down uh, by the courts, and about half of them just have no, no clue whatsoever. On the question of Congress, 
in this last election, uh, this is from September, just before the election, two-thirds of American voters didn't know that the Republicans were in control of the House of Representatives, and the same number didn't know that the Democrats controlled the Senate. And those are not the same two-thirds either. Uh, there's actually some overlap there. Um, and then we have questions about the Constitution. Uh, two-thirds of Americans can't name all three branches of government. I won't embarrass you by asking the, the audience to name all of them. Um, I'm sure you all know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Three-quarters of Americans didn't know that it takes two-thirds vote of Congress to overturn a presidential veto. And this is my favorite. 21% think that five-four Supreme Court decisions are sent back to Congress for reconsideration. <laughs> this is a ludicrous idea that the pollsters just made up to make fun of people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, here's a few more examples. The budget. Half of Americans think that foreign aid is 10% of the budget. 30% think it's more than a fifth of the federal budget. Does anybody here know what the actual figure is? Just shout it out if you know. It's about half a percent, yeah. So we're not just wrong. We're like orders of magnitude wrong. Um, one in four college graduates, actually I, I said don't know, only one in four college graduates knew that Social Security was a bigger budget item uh, than foreign aid. And the economy, the average American, if you ask a thousand random Americans what they think unemployment is, if you average their answers together, a lot of them are a lot more than this, they think unemployment is 32 percent. This is, this is like worst part of the Great Depression. People have no idea what's going on. Um, <clears throat> foreign policy. These are, this is a, a poll by YouGov asking people where the U.S. is, what countries the U.S. is bombing. Now they're pretty sure that we're bombing Iraq and Afghanistan, those seem familiar. Uh, but everybody else, you know, Syria, Somalia, Pakistan, and Yemen, people don't uh, really have any idea. Most of the population doesn't know that we're bombing those countries. Uh, and some of the population is certain that we're not. Um, it's not true. Uh, people are pretty sure we're not bombing Iran, but 13% of Americans think we are. Um, <clears throat> so here are some wrong ideas about political ignorance. Uh, Americans are just so dumb. It's Americans, you know, Americans, stupid. Those Europeans know what they're talking about, right? No, actually, Brits and other democracies, Germans, the French, Italians, all have similar levels of ignorance. Kids these days, back in my day, uh, no. Uh, IQ scores are going up. Uh, from the, we know this from the Flynn effect. Education and literacy are at their highest levels. And surveys have always shown this kind of ignorance, as long as we've been doing these surveys. Um, we need more education and information. Uh, well, being more, we're more educated than we ever have, and it doesn't actually make a difference to political knowledge. Remember, 75% uh, of college graduates didn't know that Social Security was bigger than foreign aid. And we also have the internet, Google, and Wikipedia. Uh, so there's no, there's no, it's not like people just don't know or couldn't know about these questions. Um, and finally, it's just those other guys. You know, the other guys? You know what I'm talking about. The other side? Uh, unfortunately, no. There's similar levels of ignorance uh, across all parties and ideologies. Um, <clears throat> so, what about, is it just ignorance? No, it's actually much worse than that. Um, if just ignorance was the problem, we would expect two things. New information would correct mistaken beliefs and fix the problem. It doesn't. Um, and we would expect that errors are random and cancel out. When you're ignorant <clears throat> about something, I'm ignorant about quantum physics. So I'm pretty indifferent about these questions. Um, I'm, I'll be wrong about all quantum physics questions, so don't ask me, um, but I'm indifferent. You know, I'm not passionately wrong. Uh, I, I don't go to and yell at quantum physics professors that, you know, they don't understand how atoms work. Um, and uh, so, you know, people don't just, and the fact is that people don't just roll a die when they don't know the answer to a question. We are systematically mistaken. Um, so errors aren't random, and they don't cancel out. Uh, and, and here I should mention a concept called the miracle of aggregation, which works just like every other miracle you've ever heard of, in that it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that 90% of voters may be ignorant, um, but you know, they're just rolling a die. So the average of their answers is, is just going to cancel each other out. They're going to overestimate or underestimate, and it's going to cancel out. But the 10% of voters who are informed uh, will actually uh, be the ones controlling the election. However, uh, voters' uh, errors are not random. They're systematically mistaken. Um, we're not merely ignorant. 
Uh, how do we know this? We know this from three lines of evidence, behavioral economics and psychology and lab experiments, political IQ tests, um, and expert and layman comparisons. So uh, when it comes to uh, political, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, behavioral economics and uh, psychology lab experiments, um, this is uh, Danny Kahneman and uh, Tversky, uh, who found that we have something called the availability bias. We judge the probability of something by its, uh, how easily we can remember it, which means that memorable events are judged to be very prob probable. However, memorable events like school shootings and 9-11 uh, are actually very rare. Uh, so we, we, we misjudge the probability by how easily we can remember it. We all think we're above average in intelligence, driving skills, and pretty much everything else. Um, and finally, most troublingly, uh, correcting misinformation does not dispel its effects. Sometimes it enhances them. This is John Bullock at Yale University, who did an experiment with uh, uh, liberals and conservatives. Uh, so when uh, Chief Justice John Roberts was being nominated to the Supreme Court by President George Bush, 56% of Democrats opposed his nomination. Uh, that, um, and then they were shown an ad which said that Chief Justice Roberts supports uh, people who bomb abortion clinics. Now, this ad this is not true, um, but this ad was shown on television, and it was eventually retracted for being uh, misleading. So they showed people this ad, uh, and then they showed them uh, its refutation and retraction. So what do you think happened to a uh, Democrat's opinion of Chief Justice Roberts just in this one experiment, which is that they went from 56% before watching the ad to 80% disapproving of him after watching the ad. And then after reading the correction, 72% still opposed his nomination. So it didn't go back to where it was before. Um, misinformation uh, is not easily uh, refuted. Uh, Republicans in Iraq were, Republicans on the question of WMDs in Iraq were shown reports uh, refuting the idea that Saddam Hussein had active chemical weapons programs, and then they were twice as likely to believe that he did have weapons programs, but that he destroyed or covered them up after reading evidence that this wasn't true. Um, so political IQ tests, what's the logic here? So if you give people a survey and, and uh, you ask them a bunch of basic questions, how many branches of government there are, um, and so on, and then you ask them about policy preferences, um, you find that uh, people who ace the political IQ test, people who get 100% you know, or 90%, uh, have very different preferences from ignorant people. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, what would voters know, want if they simply knew better? Um, so on foreign policy, uh, more informed voters are slightly more interventionist, but they're less likely to support full-on invasions of other countries. On social issues, they're much more liberal on abortion, gay rights, and prayer in schools. And on economic policy, uh, they're more free market uh, than less informed people uh, and less in favor of uh, expanding existing government programs. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Althaus in 2003. Uh, this is a chart, I don't know if you can see it, um, but it measures, um, it by income quintile, just to see if maybe people in different income quintiles respond to information in different ways. Um, actually, information works in the same direction for everybody. So more informed poor people are more in favor of free markets, and more informed rich people are slightly more in favor. Um, but information works the same way regardless of income. Uh, and you can control for other things as well. Uh, we also have surveys of Americans versus economists on economic questions. Uh, these are hilarious. I don't have time to really go through all of them. Um, uh, but my general presumption here is that when experts and laymen disagree about a topic that the experts really know a lot about and have spent years studying, the experts are probably right. So the public thinks that um, taxes being too high are a, a major reason for our economy not doing so well. Economists think that it's a minor reason. Um, people overwhelmingly think that foreign aid spending is too high, uh, which makes sense when you think it's uh, like 20% uh, of the budget. Uh, economists do disagree. Uh, the public thinks that business profits are too high and that's why our economy isn't doing so well. Uh, economists disagree. Um, technology is displacing workers, so smash the machines. The public is very Luddite. Uh, economists are not. Other questions, there are too many immigrants. Public believes this. Um, women and minorities get too many advantages under affirmative action. The public believes this. Economists know better. Um, <clears throat> So we have rational irrationality. This is the only graph in the chart, by the way, in the, in the talk, by the way. But I have to show you this. So basically, this is a pretty simple demand curve for irrationality, which is that we have these cognitive biases, and it feels good to indulge them. And it's very costly to overcome them. We realize this, uh, and if it was 
cheap to overcome cognitive biases, uh, we would have a very different world. So basically, um, when the, the cost of being wrong uh, goes down, um, or to zero in the case of politics, in that your vote isn't gonna tip the election. So your ill-informed opinion does not have direct negative consequences for you. Uh, so your irrationality uh, is, is an externality, basically. Uh, it's, it's worse for everyone that we all indulge them, but there's no way to overcome that. And so we have four basic biases. I can't go through all of them. Uh, we have anti-market bias, anti-foreign bias, make work bias. Uh, people underestimate the benefits of markets. Um, and they, they uh, overestimate the costs of interacting with foreigners, immigrants, and, and foreign trade. We're also very pessimistic. We think everything is getting worse all the time, uh, and it's not. Um, so, we have, so we're ignorant, we're irrational, but it gets worse, okay? Because politics makes both of these worse. Um, so, uh, Uh, so uh, the economist Daniel Klein did a study on this where he asked liberals, conservatives, and libertarians uh, question, economic questions uh, which went against their political leaning. So the right answer, we know the right answer uh, from economics and, and uh, very well established um, uh, facts in economics. Uh, we know the right answers um, and we asked people ones that challenged their biases and uh, liberals and conservatives did very poorly and uh, libertarians did even worse. Uh, this is hugely embarrassing for me. Um, uh, we also get worse at math. This is amazing to me. So Kahan and Peters uh, did an experiment where they asked people math questions, judging the efficacy of like a rash cream or something. So people who got the treatment got better or worse, and people who didn't get the treatment got better or worse. Uh, and they asked people to, to decide, uh, does, do these numbers support the idea that the cream works or not? And people are you know, pretty good at these. Um, but then you ask the same people questions uh, about gun control. Um, and uh, conservatives, when they're shown numbers that suggest that gun control works, conservatives get a lot worse at math, magically, somehow. Uh, and when you show liberals numbers that show that, uh, that suggest, these are just made up numbers, but uh, that suggest that gun control doesn't work, they get a lot worse at math too. Um, we also have confirmation bias. We overvalue information that confirms our side. Uh, we also have tribalism, where um, it's costly to question our own ide ideology, our own side. Socially costly and psychologically costly. <clears throat> so this is a, a quote from the economist Joseph Schumpeter, uh, which I love because it's just fantastic. He says, the typical citizen drops down to a lower level of mental performance as soon as he enters the political field. He argues and analyzes in a way which he would readily recognize as infantile within the sphere of his real interests. Uh, we call this ecological rationality, which is that the things that you deal with every day, the things that where you pay a real cost for being irrational, like at work, you'll get fired, um, or in business, you'll lose your business. Um, we're much more rational in those areas, but in politics, we don't pay the price for holding wrong opinions. Um, so how and why do ignorant, irrational people vote? Um, a mistaken idea is that uh, they vote for their own self-interest. So uh, poor people vote for welfare, um, and rich people vote for tax cuts, women vote for uh, 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 legal abortion, and men vote against abortion. Uh, Mitt Romney's famous 47% comment was idiotic for many reasons, but it was most idiotic because half of them voted for him in the, in the election. So he said that 47% of Americans will never vote Republican because they, they get some form of aid from the government. It's not true. Um, poor people are not substantially more Democrat than rich people. Rich people are not substantially more Republican uh, than poor people. Uh, wi women are actually slightly more pro or, or anti-abortion than men. Men are actually slightly more pro-choice. Um, and uh, uh, old people are in favor of Social Security, but less, pe less than young people are. Um, our best idea is that this is expressive signaling. We want to demonstrate that we're good people, that we support, uh, that we care about other people, that we care about tradition, that we care about our culture. We want to, we want to demonstrate to people that we're, we're good people. You know, why do we vote in internet polls? Think about this. You, you read an article and it asks you to vote on it. You're not going to determine the outcome of that poll. You're not even, it, the poll is completely meaningless. Um, but we do it because we want to demonstrate to other people. We want to express our opinion on an issue, even if our opinion is idiotic. Um, <clears throat> Why do we shout at the television uh, during sports games? Do you really think that you're influencing the, the ref's decision? No, it's just that we want to support our team. Why do, we, why do we 
strip down and dress up like idiots and run out in the snow for sports teams. Um, <clears throat> so how does public policy get made in the context of uh, uh, these ignorant, irrational voters? Um, look at the incentives of politicians and other political actors who actually create public policy. Um, they must, the politicians must gratify public biases because people really care about these things. Um, but they care in general ways. So they want to help the poor, um, defend America, et cetera. Um, when the specifics of it, uh, uh, government policies that affect specific groups more than other groups, um, they must gratify uh, interest groups in their district, which is businesses, uh, labor unions, uh, and other organized interests in their constituency, because these are the organized interests that actually help them get reelected. Um, they raise money for them and they turn out the vote. Uh, so government dispenses benefits, subsidies, regulations, taxes, and exemptions. Um, the groups most affected by this have advantages, which is concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. So imagine that I took a penny from each of the 150 million American households, and then I took that, that $1.5 million and gave it to me. So would the 150 million people who just got robbed of a penny even notice? Probably not, but I would. Uh, <laughs> because I'm getting concentrated benefits and the, the costs are dispersed. How much would they be willing to pay to stop me? Less than a penny, because the, the cost of doing nothing on this issue uh, is, is so low uh, that the cost of doing something would be tremendously costly. Uh, they also have asymmetric information. They, farmers know a lot about farm policy, businesses know a lot about business regulation, uh, and we don't. And they're already organized. Um, so interest groups will lobby for these benefits. Um, the, uh, pennies for Dan Beer Foundation, lobbies for pennies for Dan Beer. Um, and politicians can dispense these rents to favored groups who will in turn uh, help them with their reelection. Uh, however, there's a reason why I don't have a Dan Beer Foundation, pennies for Dan Beer. There's a reason why this isn't a public policy. Uh, and the reason is that politicians do have to, if they ever get exposed, it might work once, uh, but if they ever get exposed that they're giving me $150 million, uh, they don't have a rational reason for that. Um, so this is the concept called bootleggers and Baptists from economics. Um, so this is where two different groups for two different reasons end up supporting the same policy. Uh, and so the, co the concept works like this. Um, during prohibition, there were two groups that lobbied in favor of prohibition. Uh, one of them was the, the Baptists, the, the, the dry people who didn't want anyone to drink. Uh, and the other group uh, were, was actually the bootleggers because they were making tons and tons of profits um, by selling liquor illegally and they didn't want more people to compete with them. Uh, so you ended up with two groups with seemingly opposing interests supporting the same policy. And so the concept of bootleggers and Baptists is this, that stable public policy requires the support of both a popular moralistic cause, something that, that uh, appeals to expressive voters, and also organized economic interests. So the Baptists provide moral cover for the policy um, uh, with voters, and the bootleggers bankroll the lobbying effort uh, and coordinate all of this. This cooperation can be open and explicit, but more often than not, it isn't. It just happens that these two groups converge. Uh, and then we also have a political entrepreneur who can bring these two interests together and actually create the public policy. <clears throat> so examples of bootlegger Baptist coalitions are uh, ethanol, environmentalists, and the corn lobby. Uh, environmentalists actually know that ethanol is terrible, but uh, people think that it's, it's good for the environment. Buy American provisions, America, everybody loves America. And also US companies, uh, there, in one case, there is a solar panel manufacturer in the United States who was the only manufacturer who actually met the Buy American provision uh, in this bill. So they lobbied very heavily for that, that provision to be in there because it required people to buy from their specific company. Online gambling bans. Uh, fundamentalist Christians hate gambling, and casinos also hate competing with online gambling sites. Uh, GMO food labeling. Uh, this combines the food safety Baptists with the organic lobby. It's a $30 billion uh, a year industry. Uh, and the reason why we can't have uh, the Dan Beer Pennies, Pennies for Dan Beer Foundation uh, is that bootleggers without Baptists, without that moral cover, their public policies don't last or don't get enacted at all. So the TARP bailout of the banks, that expired um, because uh, there was no reason that appealed to voters why we were giving all this money to banks. Um, and uh, taxi cartels, they've lost their moral cover. And also SOPA and PIPA, the Internet Censorship Acts, um, these were basically handouts to uh, the recording and movie industries, uh, but they didn't really have any moral cover with voters, and there was massive outrage, uh, and they got, actually got defeated 
defeating special interests uh, when you don't have uh, a reason that appeals to voters. Uh, so we also have uh, national security, great example. The F-35 Lightning is a program that we are spending to uh, spending approximately $1.5 trillion on to build uh, uh, over 2,000 of these aircraft that we don't need, the Pentagon doesn't want, um, and we're spending the GDP of a medium-sized country like Australia. Uh, we're, at, we're actually spending more than the GDP of Australia building these things. We also have uh, Minuteman ICBM nuclear missiles. Uh, Congress, uh, the president has a, has a, a treaty with Russia to uh, for nuclear disarmament, so we can start closing some of these silos, right? Wrong, because closing silos is bad for people's districts. So we're just gonna take one, one, basically one missile from all of the different silos and keep all of them open, even though we, we could just take, we could just shut down one and have the same number of missiles. Um, uh, this is something that I spend a lot of time talking about. This is a cover story I wrote for a magazine I write for sometimes called The Freeman. Uh, so bootleggers and Baptists with machine guns. Uh, I wanna talk about the, the two of the most stable public policy arrangements in our country right now, uh, the war on drugs and tough on crime. Uh, they've been around for 30 or 40 years, um, and they, they keep getting uh, continual support from the public. Um, so we have everything coming together on this issue. We have ignorance. Voters don't know what the crime rate is. They're always wrong when you ask them, so they're ignorance. Checked. Pessimistic. They're not just wrong, they always think crime is going up. Every year they say crime is going up without realizing that this is kind of mathematically impossible. At some point, we're all gonna be dead. Um, crime has actually been going down for two decades, um, but people are irrational. Availability bias, so we have uh, stories like school shootings, uh, which, make, which are easy to remember, and so people think they're becoming more common and that murder rates are going up. Uh, it's not true, uh, but people remember them, uh, and it's easy to get the public on the side. So we have moralism. Everybody wants to be tough on criminals. You know, nobody wants to let violent criminals out of prison. You know, uh, we, we disapprove of drugs. And we also have the special interest support. We have uh, uh, government bureaucracies who want to protect their budgets. We have police unions, uh, prison guard unions, private prisons, um, <clears throat> all of whom are lobbying uh, in this direction. Actually, in the legalization measures in uh, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Alaska, uh, the biggest opponents uh, of, one of the biggest opponents of legalizing marijuana was the medical marijuana industry. Because if you legalize it, people don't need to go to the medical marijuana people, they can just go and buy it from someone else. Um, what's the result of this public policy uh, fiasco? The United States has more prisoners per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, more than Russia, or Belarus, or Palau, or any of those bastions of freedom. Um, <coughs> we also have uh, 4,500 criminal statutes, uh, and that's in, on, on, just federal statutes on the books where you can go to prison for uh, 4,500 different crimes. We're increasing that by about 57 new crimes a year. We have 2.2 million people locked in cages. That's about 1% of the adult population, which means that basically however many hundreds of people there are at Skepticon, um, just imagine that one of them was randomly you know, pulled away and think of, think, think of just how many people that is. Uh, 4.8 million people are out of prison but on probation or parole. That's about 2% of the adult population. We have 5.8 million uh, convicted felons in the United States uh, who can't vote and are being disenfranchised uh, because we have so many felonies on the books. We have 65 million people with some kind of record, including misdemeanors or uh, arrests. So people who, you know, that box that you always just check off without thinking, no, I don't have a criminal record. Uh, 65 million Americans have some kind of criminal record and can't get the kinds of jobs that you guys are able to get. I'm, I'm assuming that no one here is convicted felon. I, I'm sorry if that's not true. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Um, so by age 25, 30 to 40 percent of American adults will have been arrested for something other than a minor traffic violation. And that's 50 percent of black men by age 25 will have been arrested for something. Um, we have 250 million arrests in this country in the last 20 years. A lot of them are the same people, but that's a lot of people to arrest. Um, and we have 77 million people in the FBI's master criminal database. So if somebody does an FBI background check, you know, they have a pretty good shot of coming up with something on them. And we're increasing that by 10,000 names a day. Um, so what can we do about this? Uh, there's constitutional reform. A lot of people have proposed this. James Buchanan and Gordon Tulloch, two of the founders of Public Choice who just died recently, on, on election day, actually. That's 
terrible, but uh, ironic. <coughs> um, so we, constitutional politics works the same way as all politics. You can't just set up a rule um, that restrains the logic of public choice because the same people are going to be influencing the creation of that rule. Um, judicial review, basically anything that's not mentioned, any rights that are not mentioned explicitly in the Bill of Rights, um, the government can just pass a law restricting uh, liberties along that dimension um, because <clears throat> Uh, of the rational basis test. It means that if, if some conceivable universe could exist, you know, if it's, if it's logically coherent, um, then the, the government can do it and the courts can't step in to strike down the law. Uh, that, that's a whole other talk. Uh, checks and balances. Um, this is a feature of our constitutional system that's supposed to pit interests against each other. This is very primitive pr public choice, but the founders kind of understood it. Um, uh, these actually operate more as toll booths uh, than walls, than restrictions on, on what politicians can do. Um, because, you know, it does slow the growth of these regulations and these, these laws passed for special interests. Um, but it's basically you have to pay a toll. You have to pay off the interests along the way. So each senator needs to get something uh, from Obamacare. Uh, and so we get a piece of uh, kludge, which is an ad hoc solution just layered on, you know, a temporarily... Uh, effective collection of, of policies. So we got Obamacare, uh, which is not what Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, or the Democratic Party wanted. It wasn't what the Republican Party wanted. It wasn't really what anybody wanted, uh, except that we have these systems in place. We have employer-provided insurance. We have a private uh, individual insurance market. And we also have Medicaid. Um, and so we just decided more of that. You know, we're going to subsidize individual insurance. We're going to mandate more employer insurance. And we're going to expand Medicaid. Uh, this is not something that someone would design on purpose, but it's the best we can do. We can't just scrap the system and start over with something that makes more sense, like single payer. Now, I'm not particularly in favor of single payer, but it makes a lot more sense of, than our current policy. Um, and also, the Constitution is a goddamn piece of paper. This is a quote attributed to George Bush, but it's apocryphal, so I didn't uh, put his name there. Um, but it. The Constitution only works if people actually believe the words that are on the paper. Um, and so uh, about the turn of the 19th century, uh, states bankrupted themselves because of public choice, because all of these special interests were organizing to get public funds. So they were guaranteeing uh, loans for building canals and railroads and businesses, and they were just giving away money from state budgets to uh, private interests. And so 49 states actually have clauses in their constitutions which forbid giving uh, uh, state money or, or gifts to uh, private business interests, uh, and they're just not enforced. Um, so what does this all mean when taken together? Um, thanks, to the, thanks to the First Amendment, there is a, a wall of separation between uh, religious ignorance uh, and irrationality and public policy, uh, shielding our other institutions, civil, economic, and social, from the effects of uh, religious ignorance and irrationality. Unfortunately, we don't have any such protection or recourse from non-religious irrationality. Democracy, in fact, weaponizes public ignorance and empowers special interests over the general welfare. We have uh, incoherent policies that, that, like farm subsidies, which help only farmers and hurt all American consumers, but we can't do anything about it because of the logic of public choice. So voters don't know what's best for everyone. They don't even know who's in charge. They don't know who to blame when things go wrong or, or praise when things go right. Um, politicians uh, seek to satisfy the irrational public biases because if they don't, they will lose an election. They have to. There's just a natural selection away from politicians who stand on principle. Um, so they, they gratify public desires like safety good, crime bad, by passing you know, ostensibly um, public-spirited legislation, the, the Less Crime, More Safety Act, uh, or whatever. Um, but the details of these laws are shaped by and for the satisfaction of the special interest groups that they most uh, directly affect, uh, including uh, government bureaucracies. Uh, and this often leads to unintended consequences which undermine our other important interests, justice, fairness, fiscal responsibility, or even the original stated interest, as in the case of bans on casino gambling or, pro or uh, alcohol prohibition. Um, <clears throat> So the result is that well-intentioned people end up supporting public policies that make them feel good rather than ones that actually do good. We should be extremely skeptical about whether proposed policies will really have their intended effects and whether the expressed intention is really the same as the intentions of the people who are actually crafting the details of the policy. So voting is, not, is just not a fair or rational way to aggregate public preferences. Um, 
or, or balance people's interests. Um, it is never a reasonable way to settle matters of scientific fact, and yet it is so often portrayed that way, uh, particularly by climate change deniers uh, and creationists, but not solely them, also uh, people who oppose uh, genetic engineering. Uh, and it is rarely a reasonable way to settle legitimate differences of opinion between um, people who just disagree about what's best for their own lives, uh, what kind of health care plan is best for them, uh, and so on. Um, and so uh, we, we have uh, this, this severe problem uh, with voting. Uh, democracy isn't all bad. It's the best system we have. Um, it, uh, and it, indeed, it, it's revolutionized the world and the peaceful transfer of power between rulers. Um, but we should have a clear view of its logic, incentives, and lim limitations. Just as we acknowledge market failures, uh, failure to provide public goods, externalities, pollution, and so on, th things that don't match up to the perfect models uh, that we have, uh, the, the perfect models for uh, economies and markets that we design, so too do uh, actual politics not line up with the idealized models that we promote. Um, we should try to refrain from having strong opinions that we don't know anything about. Um, or at least refrain from inflicting those opinions on others via the ballot box. Um, give others the space to pursue their own lives in their own way, uh, as much as possible, um, and insist that they extend you the same courtesy. Uh, I think we'd, we'd all be a little bit better off for that, uh, and that means uh, reducing the importance of politics in our lives. Um, and uh, I believe I'm just about out of time, so I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there. And if you want to harass me afterwards with questions or tell me how wrong I am, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much.